What a good day to be in God's house. Whether you had a, a great week or a challenging week, this is still the place to be, isn't it? And I, I appreciate Stephanie, even as she was struggling through that song, and uh, I just kept thinking that God's got this. So many times we go through difficult times, but our hope and our assurance comes from the truth that we are not alone and that if we will surrender to him, he knows what's best, whatever that might be. So we are in this series on resolutions for faithful living, and uh, I hope that you're keeping the resolutions we've made so far. I think this has been kind of fun. We think about resolutions as being the things we make the first week of the year, but we're in week five, and here we go. We're still resolving to live faithfully because we want to be able to look back on ourselves next year at this time and go, wow, I've grown closer to God because of what I resolved to do at the beginning of the year. So this year, this Sunday, we're going to talk about something that's maybe not your favorite subject, and, um, but that's okay because I want you to know that it's a godly subject. Today we're going to talk about giving, giving generously. And this is a really important aspect of our relationship with God, so I hope that this is a resolution that you will hear and make as well, all right? So when we talk about giving, it's natural for us to start in the Old Testament, and, and really the Bible gives us a pretty long history of giving. Perhaps you remember the story of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's first two sons. Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a shepherd, and they both brought gifts to the Lord, but there was a difference. While Cain brought some of his gifts some of his crops to the Lord. The Bible tells us that Abel brought the best of the firstborn of his flocks. And so what that indicates to us is that there was a heart difference. There was a difference between a checking the box, here's something, and a giving your all to say, here's the best that I have. And so Abel's offering was considered acceptable to God while Cain's was not. And then Genesis, if we read a little further, tells us about um, the story of Abram before he was Abraham. And Abram had won a great victory. And so he gave a tenth of everything he gained from that to Melchizedek, who was the high priest, also called the king of Salem, or the priest of the God Most High. He didn't give because it was a commandment. He didn't give because it was required. It was just an outpouring of gratitude towards the Lord for him to celebrate victory. And it was natural for him to give a tenth back to the kingdom. Then in the book of Numbers, we see where God instructed the Israelites to give a tenth of their produce or yield to the Levites as a way of providing for the priests and the care of the temple or the tabernacle. So this is where the word tithe began. And the word tithe means tenth, okay? Literally, it means a tenth. So anytime you hear the word tithe or we hear we're collecting our tithes, um, that's a tenth, right? You can't tithe 2% because that doesn't make sense to 10%, 2%, right? Tithe is a tenth. And that was the the regulation that God set up for Israel to take care of his servants and his house, all right? And that tithe was considered a holy or a sacred offering. And God instructed the Israelites at that time to be sure and give the Lord the best of what is given to you. Throughout the Old Testament, then, we read about the tithes being brought to the place of worship. And there were other offerings and sacrifices that were made, but over and over again you see this tithe coming to the tabernacle or to the temple, to the place of worship in order to provide for the ministry there. And then in the book of Malachi, which is the last book of the Old Testament written by the prophet Malachi, he says, you need to bring your full tithe into the house of worship. Your full tithe. 
not what's left over, not your 2%, 10%, right? The full tithe. And Malachi writes that you are cheating God when you withhold your tithe from him. And so this is, this is the principle of giving that we see in the Old Testament, that God's children are under an obligation to bring a tithe to the place of worship. And this is the same as bringing your tithe to God himself. And as we bring that tithe, what we also learn is that it should be from the first and the best of what we have. Not an afterthought, but of first importance. This obligation meant that his church is cared for and that the funds are there to accomplish what the church is supposed to do. I wonder how much our churches could do in America if people were faithful to bring their tithes. So you see, giving to God is a matter of obedience. And the tithe is a system that expects the same of everyone. And I think that's kind of a cool part about the tithe, right? That it's not about the amount you bring, right? So not everybody has to bring $10,000, right? No, it's, it's everybody brings a portion, the same portion of what you have been given. And so if you earned a little, your tithe is small. If you earned a lot, your tithe is a lot. Do you see how that works? It is a principle that applies fairly to everyone. And when we follow that, we establish our understanding that everything we have comes from the Lord. Every good and perfect gift is from the Father above. I would bet that many people in our world have no idea that God is the source of their provision. But we as Christians have the privilege of knowing where our provision comes from. So our increase is a gift from God. And we acknowledge that in obedience by gifting a portion back to him. Giving to God is a sign of, of a heart that's turned towards God. It reflects the generosity of God and it shows our thankfulness for what he provides doesn't it? And so while we might follow it out of an act of obedience, at the same time, it's an act of thankfulness too. And it keeps our money and possessions from holding a place in our hearts that's dearer than they should be, right? I trust God. I love God so much that I can give away of this precious thing I have. I can just give it back to him because nothing matters more to me than he does. And so then as we enter the New Testament, we enter it with that same understanding that the tithe is a principle of a giving that's assigned to all Christians. But we also see something greater at work. Because giving to God in the New Testament goes way beyond the tithe. There was a point at which Jesus was talking to the religious leaders of the day and here's what he said. Yes, you should tithe. You see, the tithe is still there. Jesus said, yes, you should tithe. But you shouldn't neglect the other more important things like justice and mercy and faith. And so what Jesus is saying is your tithe is important, but don't do it out of legalism. Don't check the box and think that everything is good while you're denying others of the mercy and justice that they, do, that they need. And we must be cautioned by that, that tithing is never a guarantee of our relationship with God. It's not. We don't tithe so that we're okay with God. We tithe because we're in a relationship with God. Our giving will never save us. But our attitude towards giving should reflect the heart of God. And what does that look like? We'll consider some of the instances of giving that are reported in the New Testament. I love this, all right? Consider the little boy who was there among the crowds who came to hear Jesus teach one day. There were hungry people all around, thousands of them, and the disciples didn't know what to do. What are we going to do? These people are hungry, and there is no McDonald's nearby, right? Right? John 6 tells us that there was a little boy in the crowd and that he gave what he had to the disciples, two fish 
and five loaves. And then it says, Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed to them, them to the people. And afterward, he did the same with the fish, and they all ate as much as they wanted. Everyone was full. Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. You see, that little boy gave everything he had. I wonder if before he offered it up, he thought about, well, what am I going to eat for lunch? Or I wonder if his mom was waiting at home for him to bring those things back from the market and, and somehow they didn't come back and maybe he was afraid of getting in trouble. This is speculation. I don't know. But you know what I do know? That he gave everything he had and in the hands of Jesus, it fed thousands that is the supernatural act of a God who is generous and who will take our little and make a lot from it. Do you see? Wouldn't it be cool to get to heaven one day and that little boy's there and you go, he's like, I brought the fishes and loaves. That was me. I saw what God did to that. You know, I don't know. Do you ever think about all these people in heaven and what it'll be like when we get to meet them? Yeah. And here's another lady that I would like to meet, because this is the widow who brought her offering to the temple. Do you remember this story? Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich people put in large amounts. And then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For gave, they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. She gave everything she had. Even at the risk of going home to an empty cupboard, she gave her two coins to the offering. I don't know about you, but do you ever feel like your offering is so small that it probably doesn't make a difference? Especially compared to other people's offerings, you're like, well, I, you know, what is my $2 going to mean compared to their 2000 You know, it's just, it doesn't really matter. And what Jesus says is it does. It does matter. And he sees, he sees our offerings just as much today as he did for that poor widow. Do you see? And he looked at her and he said, this, this is the one who gave more than anybody else. She gave out of her heart that was turned to God and towards the temple and what would be done with the money there. And she gave out of a heart that was surrendered to God, not willing to hold back even if it meant uncertainty in her life. Now, I have no doubt that Jesus provided for everything she needed after that. What do you think? But maybe she didn't know that when she put in her two coins. Maybe she just trusted that it would all work out either way. I'd like to meet her one day, too. After that, we see the story of the early church that gathered together. And you remember that you know, one of our resolutions is to meet together the way that they did, right? Then what it said is that everyone there shared in life and they shared their meals. And when somebody had a need, someone else would sell their possessions and give the money so that those needs would be met. Acts 4.34 says there were no needy people among them because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Can you imagine that kind of caring coming from a community? I can. Can you imagine selling your house or your land so that you could help meet the, other, the needs of others? Oh, that's hard. Right? How many times are we just used to giving out of our surplus? And yet what we see in this early church is they sold what they, sold what they had so that everybody could be taken care of. Right? That's a heart turned towards God, isn't it? 
That's a heart that says, God, I know you love these people and I want to do what I can to take them. So I'm not going to sit here on my wealth while they go without. And that's the kind of generous giving that our God calls us to do. And you know what? He set the example for us, didn't he? You know the generous grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. So that by his poverty he could make you rich. Jesus owned it all. But he gave it up to become a servant. So that we could experience this freedom. This freedom that we sang about, right? All of that freedom that we think about and that we share today comes because of the lavish, generous love of a God who gave up everything for us. What kind of God is that? Who would make himself lower than low? Who would walk this earth in poverty? Who would die a humiliating death accused of of evil that he had not done? Why? So that we could have freedom. We serve a God who gave up his son for the sake of mere humans. That ought to blow your mind. And so if we want to be more like him, we too should be generous for his sake. Jesus gave it all. What will I give in return? It's easy for us to sing about how I surrender everything or I give it all to you or lay me down and you can have it all. But the truth of the matter is very often our bank account is the last thing we want to lay down, isn't it? Because I need that, right? Because that's my security. Because I worked hard for that. Because I deserve that. Because other people's offerings will cover for mine. It's so easy for us to hold on to what we have instead of giving it away generously. And I'm not talking about foolishly, right? Even Paul talks about how you shouldn't give away what you need, you know, what you need so that others can have the easy life. I think that's how he puts it, right? But I'm talking about giving out of obedience and out of a heart that's surrendered to God that says, you know, God, I know everything I have belongs to you. So help me to be a good steward of it and to give generously from it. And so as a disciple of Christ, I will intentionally and gratefully give what begins with a tithe And then I will give beyond that as he calls me to, right? Not trying to hold on to money so that I feel safe, but instead being willing to let go of it for the sake of the kingdom. Because when I do that, then then the kingdom can meet the needs of others. Do you see? And when when we pool our resources and we give to people that have needs, you know what they see? Hopefully they don't see us. Hopefully they see the God that's taking care of them right? I can remember times in the past giving gifts to people and them crying and saying, I don't understand this. I don't understand it either. But we have a God that gives everything for us. And we have a God that cares about you enough to meet your needs, and he will use his people to do it. How amazing is that? What kind of testimony is that to show others the lavish love that he has for them? We are so quick to hold on to our money. What would it look like if we just let go and let God use it however he wants? I resolve to give generously to God and others as a reflection of his love and my trust in him. That's my resolution. Matthew 6, 21, Jesus said, for where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And so we ask, where is your treasure? 
Is it in earthly things like money or possessions or your home or your wardrobe? Is that where your peace comes from? Maybe you think, I know I'll be okay because I have plenty in the bank. Is that your treasure? Or is your treasure Jesus? I know I'll be okay because I belong to Jesus who promises to give us everything we need in this life in order to prepare us for the next. Right? And I don't believe in, I don't believe in this health, wealth, and prosperity thing that says if you give, you're going to be rich and have all these things. You know, that doesn't line up with the word of God to me because I know that Jesus said it's hard for a rich man to get to heaven, right? No, I think he wants to invest in us now so that we have what we need to survive this world, but also to prepare us for the next. And part of that preparation is to understand the giving and the generosity of God and to emulate him. Where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. Let me read to you from 2 Corinthians 9. Verses 6 through 10. And in in this text, Paul is addressing the church at Corinth because they are taking up an offering for the persecuted Christians in Jerusalem. Do you remember that? That was like a big thing of Paul's. And he went to a lot of the churches and was asking them to do collections. And some of those churches, he even said, you know, I know that you're struggling. I know that you're suffering too. And yet in your poverty, you are still finding ways to give to our fellow believers. And so here's what he says to this church. He says, remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all you need then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor, and their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides the seed for the farmer and then the bread to eat. And in the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Don't you want to see a harvest of generosity in you? Wouldn't that be an amazing thing for one day to get to heaven and God go, Oh, I know you. You had a harvest of generosity. You took those seeds I got, I gave you and look at what you did. Right? Not so that we could have a lot, but so that the kingdom could have a lot. It's one thing to invest in you. It's a far better thing to invest in him, isn't it? When we are faithful to give, he is faithful to take care of everything we need and more. I believe that. Do you? Is that your testimony? We've been through difficult times in our household, even recently, where when we did a budget, it didn't work. There is simply not enough money to do the things that we have to do. But you know what? God took care of all of it. Sometimes through you. It was a good reminder that everything we have comes from Him. And if we are faithful to give to Him first, we don't have to worry about everything else. He has more than enough for you. And if we wait until we can afford to tithe, it will never happen because it's like a seed that never gets planted. If you're waiting for the day to come when you have enough money to give back to God, it will not happen. Keep waiting because you hold those seeds in your hands or put them in a 
bank account or under the mattress or something like that instead of putting them where they can yield a harvest of generosity, right? The harvest never comes when we keep the seeds to ourselves. So I'm praying that in 2021, God produces a harvest of generosity in us and that we can look back later and say, wow, wow, look at how these seeds we've planted have grown. And look at how God provided for me when I didn't think there was a way. Or look at how God used me to bless others. Look at how I have grown because I have learned to surrender everything to him, even my checkbook. I want to trust him more. I really do. I really do want to start at that place of a tithe, which is the basic obedience, and see what God can do with the rest that I give away.